Thank you, Summer. And uh, I really, really sincerely wish I was with all of you. Uh, my employer does not allow me to travel yet, which is, um, um, you could imagine, frustrating because I love meeting people um, and being there in person. Um, before I get going with moving in slides, I have to get right to the big main message, which is that, in my opinion, I haven't done a scientific study of, of this, but in my opinion, the number of people, the number of gardeners in Oklahoma who care about pollinators and who care about native plants and planting native plants for pollinators, that number is getting bigger. And it is my opinion that we are an intense bunch who is really, really passionate and, and almost greedy about getting more plants out there for pollinators. And therefore, we have a tendency to spend a lot of money so uh, I may be wrong, but, is, but it is my sense that there is money to be made in your industry uh, by catering even more in the future to the, uh, to the desires of the people who are planning stuff for pollinators. So that, that is a big take home mess, maybe the most important take home message. Uh, and now I'll show you some pollinators and flowers to, to see why, let you know why we care so much about them. First, to introduce who I work for, I work for a nonprofit, the Xerces Society for Invertebrate Conservation. With invertebrate conservation, that means, of course, we're working to save all the little, the little critters, insects like butterflies, uh, but also bees and spiders and freshwater mussels. And eventually, maybe we'll even get into marine work, though we don't do much work on crabs or lobsters or oysters, anything like that at this point. I also work for the US Department of Agriculture's NRCS. Uh, to be more correct, the Xerces Society pays my salary, but they have me nested within the US Department of Agriculture to help NRCS accomplish its mission of helping farmers and ranchers. But even NRCS is developing more of an urban agriculture program. I'm actually friends with the current director of the urban agri agricultural program um, out, of, uh, out of DC. Uh, and so they will be working more, I think, with promoting pollinator habitat in cities and towns. Okay, why, why should we care about pollinators at all? Well, of course, they're really important for flowers. More than 85% of plant species require animals, usually insects, to move pollen from flower to flower. And of course, uh, they are important for our health and our economy. Many of the foods we eat are due to pollinators. Many of the healthiest foods we eat, fruits and vegetables, come from insect pollinated plants. And the statistics I'm providing here, over $27 billion worth of crops in the US, that's an old number. So the number right now, uh, don't know it, it's gonna be higher than that, especially with inflation lately. Okay. I want to give you a brief intro to pollinator diversity. You need to know, I'd like you to know, that there are thousands of species of pollinators in North America. Yes, thousands. For instance, there are over 800 species of butterflies alone. Uh, there are other species, uh, of course, that are pollinators. So we've, uh, can you see my cursor, Summer? Good. Okay, up here in the upper center, we've got a moth. In the upper right, we've got a fly. There are fly species that are good pollinators. In the lower left is a beetle. Many beetles are pollinators. In the lower center, we've got a wasp. And then over here, the lower right, of course, are the bees, which on average are the most effective pollinators. And speaking of bees, the most famous bee of all is the honeybee. Now it's not a typical bee, it's sort of a super bee in, the, in, the, in its incredibly social behavior and our ability to take advantage of that social behavior by putting them in hives and of course moving them from crop to crop. They are the most important pollinator for agriculture. There's no doubt about that and they always will be. However, I wanna let you know that there are 4,000 species of native bees in the US. Honeybees are from Europe but we have 4,000 species of bees that have been here for thousands of years pollinating our flowers. 
and they come in all shapes and sizes and colors. And they're really, really important. Uh, for instance, a study done out at UC Berkeley found that when they had to, uh, uh, sun gold tomato, which is a super tasty cherry, orange colored cherry tomato, when they had native bees that tripled the production of this tomato variety, uh, especially bumblebees. Bumblebees are fantastic for pollinating tomato flowers. However, our pollinators are in trouble, and many of you have heard this. They are declining at an alarming rate. At least 28% of our, uh, our bumblebee species are threatened. Over 16%, over 17% of our butterflies are in trouble. Many factors are contributing to this. The biggest one is usually habitat loss. We've gotten rid of lots of the prairies. We've, we've gotten rid of lots of the, the open woodlands where they used to live um, and converted them to factories or, or shopping malls, whatever. We have a major need for conservation action, not just for pollinators, but for insects in general. There is a, if, if you compile all the studies that are being done by insect ecologists around the world, you'll find that overall, there's been a 24% decline in insect abundance over the last 30 years and a 50% decline or over 75 years. 50% decline in insects in the world. Think what that does to the animals that eat those insects, the birds for instance, or the bats. Think of what happens uh, to the crops that aren't being pollinated. Now, yeah, if we're getting a 50% decline in pest species, that, 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 that can be a good thing, but that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about 50% decline of everything. And that's a major problem. So what can gardeners do to help? I want to guarantee you that what gardeners do what we do in urban and suburban lots, what we do, the landscaping that we do around schools and libraries and um, industrial buildings, churches, it matters. It really, really matters. Creating habitat is the most important thing we can do for our pollinators and even small spaces contribute to conservation especially if lots of people are doing it. And um, we at the Xerces Society are working with many other partners to try to convince as many people as possible, whether they be farmers and ranchers or they be gardeners um, or folks who are involved with uh, their church, their school, to, to plant habitat, big or small. An example of how gardeners and really landscapers made a difference is with this incredibly beautiful species from South Florida, the Atala butterfly. So we've got this little but extremely brightly colored butterfly on the left and on the right are its caterpillars. Extremely hard to believe really. They look like little dollops of strawberry jam covered with little, little spots of butter or yellow paint. Beautiful little things. This butterfly was going extinct in the US. And then landscapers started planting this native cycad, Kunti in Florida, Latin name Zamia and Tegufolia. This happens to be the host plant for those cute little caterpillars I just showed you. The landscaping industry, by planting lots of these in lots in West Palm Beach and Fort Lauderdale, Miami, created all this habitat for the butterfly and the butterfly is now in good shape thanks to landscapers. Uh, another neat example of how small spaces matter is the rusty patched bumblebee. Now take a look at the bee. Uh, looks like a bumblebee, it's pretty obvious a bumblebee. Notice that rusty patch on the abdomen. It's the only bumblebee we have in the east that looks like that. Well, it's the only bumblebee, um, or the first bumblebee at least, that got listed as an endangered species in the lower 48 states. That happened a few years ago, I think uh, early 2017. This, butter, this bumblebee lives in rural areas on farms, but it also lives in towns and cities and new populations of this bee on the endangered species list 
has been found in people's gardens in urban Madison, Wisconsin, in urban Minneapolis. I have a coworker who found this in her garden. It's an endangered species. How cool is that? The plants she planted are helping save an endangered species, an endangered species. An example closer to home is the two-spotted bumblebee. This bumblebee was declared extinct or extirpated from Oklahoma around 2004. None had been seen for 20 years. In 2019, still nobody had seen them for 20 years or so. But then, and this made the, this made the TV and this made the newspaper, a bumblebee researcher found them at the Oklahoma City Zoo using the flowers that the landscapers had planted at the Oklahoma City Zoo. And then, what about this summer? Well, I have friends, graduate student friends here in Stillwater, and they went looking around and they started finding this bumblebee in gardens in Stillwater. And that uh, photo I, is a photo I took because they told me, go to Insect Adventure on the OSU campus, garden, and you're gonna find this bumblebee. And indeed I did, it was using lamb's ears, uh, feeding primary. The gardens that they installed provided habitat for this bumblebee we thought was gone in the state for over 20 years. So now I wanna talk a little bit about bee biology and butterfly biology, just to make sure we all have the basics to help us to, I want you to have the basics to help you uh, know what you need to do to help these pollinators. First off, you need to know that bees are the only pollinators to consume pollen and nectar. So that's part of why they're such amazing pollinators because yeah, they like the sweet stuff. They like that sweet nectar, but they're also going for the protein rich pollen. And by intentionally going after pollen, that means they're more likely to carry it from flower to flower. And what do pollinators need, bees and others? They need a variety of flowers. So given that they like, the butterflies like nectar and bees like nectar and pollen, let's give them as much as we can and let's give them a variety of it, a wide variety of it. I wanna talk very briefly about where bees live, where our native bees live at least. And it turns out, if you look in the upper left, upper right, I should say, that 70% of our bees species nest underground. I, I did not know that, I'm embarrassed to say, before I took this position about five years ago. I'm a, I'm a butterfly ecologist by training. But our, that, what that means is our soil is really important. We wanna have soil that's in good shape, it's friable, not high, heavily compacted, um, well-drained, ideally, to have ground nesting bees. 30% or maybe 29% of our bee species nest in stems or in tree trunks or tunnels of some kind. So what that means is we want to leave some stems up on the property if you can. Now I know it's not particularly pretty. Uh, one possibility is you can take dead stems. Let's say you're growing sunflowers. Um, you could take those sunflowers and after they die in the fall, like right now, uh, dig them up. Uh, maybe chop, chop off the side branches and then go transport them to a part of the property, not as visible, and then do what you can. Uh, sunflowers may be a tough example because they have a wide base, but try to jam them into the ground uh, where they could serve as, continue to serve as habitat for stem nesting bees. On the left, we see bumblebees. Bumblebees nest in small cavities. So uh, maybe in an old mouse burrow, maybe under a tuft of grass or in a compost pile. It's a little harder to know what to provide for bumblebees, but compost piles, can't go wrong with compost piles. So this is just reiteration, please include nesting habitat for your bees. Uh, this could include logs, small logs left on the ground, for instance. Now a little bit about butterfly biology. This is more well known. People know that butterflies their caterpillars at least like the plants and that they tend to be host plant specialists. For instance, monarch caterpillars like the one shown on the right only eat milkweed plants. And so if you wanna have monarchs, best way to get them is to have flowers for the adults or to have milkweeds for the caterpillars. Speaking of flowers, 
Butterflies tend to use a variety of nectar species, but they do show preferences. For instance, back to the monarch, which is the species I work on most. Of the thousands of species of flowering plants in a region, monarchs only visit a few of them, maybe 100 or 150, frequently. They tend to be flowers in either the aster family, like the sunflowers, or this bidens here, or plants in the dogbane family, which now includes milkweeds. Milkweeds have been wrapped into the dogbane family, or they tend to go to mint flowers or plot flowers in the vervain family, the verbenas. So the nectar plants you put out there matter. They're not just using things at random. Another tip to help beetles, butterfly caterpillars, moth caterpillars, and more is to occasionally in the fall, leave the leaves. Don't rake them all up. Now I know many of us like our garden to look extremely neat and tidy, but when we make it extremely neat and tidy by taking away the leaves, we're getting rid of the protective habitat that the leaves would provide for immature pollinators. So if you can stomach it, please consider leaving the leaves. Obviously, eventually they decompose and improve the soil. But in winter, they're really helpful as for providing habitat. So in some habitat requirements for pollinators, they need food, nectar, pollen, and host plants. They need shelter, places where they can nest in the spring and summer, places where they can spend the winter, where they'll have refuge. They need protection. Now, I haven't talked about this, but ideally they'll have protection from pesticide risk and protection from habitat disturbance. Uh, and of course, pollinators, their life cycle goes around all year. So it doesn't help much if we're providing flowers for them in the summer, but they have nowhere to live in the winter. They need habitat, spring, summer, winter, fall. Back to a point I made earlier, you don't need large acreage to make a difference. So that's why the home gardeners can do a lot um, and actually um, plant a heck of a lot of species and invest a lot of time and get a lot of joy out of gardening in a small space for pollinators. Because if you plant the right plants, the pollinators will show up and they are very entertaining to follow. If you are at, uh, consider putting in an office garden uh, around next to your school, next to where you work, next to your church, uh, put in a small pollinator garden. They will work. They will benefit pollinators. Uh, pretty innovative idea is to, uh, if you have a sidewalk strip that would normally just have Bermuda grass in between, uh, right between the uh, street and the sidewalk, put in flowers. It's good for pollinators. It's good for the good for the nursery and landscape industry too. Not good for the turf grass industry, but good for the nursery and landscape industry. And same thing with this slide, lawn conversion. Um, I still have some lawn. We are my wife and I are lucky enough. We have a 10 acre farm just outside of Stillwater. We still have some Bermuda grass lawn. Why? Because there's a function to it. I've got a 16 year old son who loves to go out there and play, throw the football with his buddies. We can't, it can't all be pollinator habitat. But if you convert, convert part of your lawn, like this person on the, um, on the right did, convert part of the lawn to gardens, pollinators, it makes a big difference. And um, please do what you can to protect the habitat from pesticides. Insecticides in particular, uh, can be, uh, I mean, insecticide, you know what they do, they kill insects. Um, so be careful. If you must use them, uh, try to minimize their use, read the guidance carefully, um, but even label instructions, even when they're followed, there is harm in at times being done to native pollinators. I can't remember if I have another slide after this on this topic. Uh, yes, I do. Um, what I want to share here is there are studies that have been happening the last couple of years showing that plants, particularly milkweed plants, 
from the nursery trade that are being taken home are poisoning monarch caterpillars because they were treated uh, at the nursery with insecticide. So that is, that is clearly a problem. So please do what you can to minimize that. It is a real thing. Now, Xerces Society, we do have a, we have a whole team of people de uh, devoted to studying pesticides and learning about their effects on pollinators and trying to promote more pollinator friendly use of pesticides. And so we have a, uh, a whole set of guidelines uh, titled Organic Pesticides, Minimizing Risk to Pollinators. And it is a free download from our website. I'm gonna briefly talk about big scale stuff just because that's what I usually do. And because some of you might have farms and ranches and might be interested in this topic. And then I'll go back to really, I'll focus on, on, on the get right to the flowers. So if you have major acreage, who can help you out with pollinator habitat? Well, the NRCS, Natural Resources Conservation Service, is probably the number one place to go. The Farm Bill does provide money to help create pollinator habitat and monarch habitat here in Oklahoma. And I know numerous people who, who are getting help from NRCS. My wife and I on our farm have a contract with NRCS um, to install pollinator habitat. It's a cost share program. They spend a, gave us a little bit of money. We spend probably more money than them putting in pollinator habitat. And an example of what we've done, uh, part of our property was dominated by large cedar trees. A hundred years ago, what you see was prairie, but the cedar trees came over and it turned it into a cedar forest. And what grows under a cedar forest? Nothing. There's no pollinator habitat down there because there are no flowers. They, they can't get any light and the cedar trees steal all the water. So, I got some assistance initially, actually from the state of Oklahoma, uh, from the conservation, uh, the local conservation district to chop down cedar trees. And we got rid of about a thousand of them. And it was a lot of work, uh, but once we got rid of uh, cedars in some areas, we sowed wildflower seeds and eight months later, it looked amazing and fed a lot of bees and butterflies. And these are some of the plants, uh, some of the native plants that happen to be in that seed mix. So what should you plant? And this applies to everyone, whether you have a farm, a ranch, or a small garden. In general, try to focus on native plants. In general, try to focus on perennial plants. Most of our natives that are good for pollinators happen to be perennials. One of my absolute favorites is an annual, and I'll talk about that one. Please focus on species with high pollinator value. How will you know which species have high, high pollinator value? The Xerces Society uh, has created lists of that include some of those plants for Oklahoma. And uh, over on the left, it actually shows one and I'll show you that again in a minute. Of course, you wanna pick plants that are appropriate to the site. Um, native plants, uh, uh, there's a wide variety of them. Some of them are meant for wet areas. Some are meant for extremely well-drained areas. Some of them will grow anywhere, but you got to find out the requirements of each plant species, of course. Ideally, you will plant species that are easy to establish, but I know from experience, those of us who are really passionate about pollinators will plant things that are difficult um, too, because we, we love the challenge. Ideally, you will plant stuff, uh, seeds or plants that are free of pesticides. Ideally, you will plant uh, flowers that bloom in all seasons of the growing season, all portions of the growing season. And ideally, you will include butterfly host plants. So now I'll go into some details on these guidelines. Oh, but first, the lists that I mentioned. On the left is a plant list for monarchs. Um, now, I'm just showing you pictures of the front of the document, but inside the document, it's a four page document. If you open up the document, um, there's a list of 25 great 
plants for this region. Same thing for the document on the right. That's for pollinators in general. These lists are available at our website. So to find them, you would simply search Xerces monarch plant list or Xerces pollinator plant list, and they'll be free download online. If I was there, I'd be handing out, I'd have stacks of these to give away because I have lots in my office, but so I wish I was there. Okay, what are some of the plants on the list? Of course, we've got host plants like swamp milkweed, uh, and like the name suggests, it likes wet areas, including pond edges, uh, but it does well in gardens if irrigated, and it's a beautiful plant with fragrant pink flowers. This happens to be my favorite perennial in North America for many reasons, and I've done a fair amount of research on this plant, uh, most of which needs to get published. I uh, haven't published it yet. It is a very long-lived perennial if given the right site. Uh, the flowers are usually cowboy orange, but they can come in other shades, and I'll show that in a minute. But this plant must have well-drained soil. It does not like heavy clay that stays moist in the winter. That will cause the taproot to rot. So if you want to keep this plant happy, uh, put it in a raised bed, give it some sand, but do not plant this in heavy sticky clay, in my experience. And uh, this is just to show you the variety of colors. And this has actually made it into the nursery trade. Uh, usually the ones I see for sale are cowboy orange, um, but the, I'm also seeing the one on the right, um, the bright yellow one, and, and those are, you can go out, especially to Western Oklahoma, um, near, near Jet and Cherokee and, and find populations that are bright lemon yellow. Uh, also, we have some that are in between. Beautiful plant. And here's proof that monarch caterpillars do like this milkweed. Another neat milkweed, uh, one is much less uh, popular at this stage, but I think its popularity should rise, is aquatic milkweed. Yes, aquatic milkweed. It grows in rivers and swamps, but it doesn't need rivers and swamps. Monarch larvae love it. Pollinators love the flowers. And as the final bullet mentions, it does fine in Oklahoma gardens, as long as you don't allow it, the soil to get really dry. But it doesn't, it, just moderate conditions. It does not need a swamp or a river by any means. And amazingly, it does really well in pots and uh, overwinters in pots. Uh, and I have seen this plant, I have purchased this plant numerous times from uh, nursery, nursery owners here in, here in Oklahoma. Um, and um, I have success every time. So it's an easy to grow plant. Great for monarchs and pollinators in general. Another plant, uh, another plant butterfly relationship to mention is maybe the most exotic flower in Oklahoma, the passion flower, Passiflora incarnata. Flower on the left, obviously. Uh, on the far right is the Gulf fritillary butterfly and female Gulf fritillary butterflies only lay their eggs on passion flower. And the photo in the middle is of the, the spiky caterpillar of that species. If you plant passion flower, you will almost certainly get these caterpillars and these butterflies. And the flower alone is, uh, it's fantastic. Easy to grow. So very importantly, I mentioned earlier, you wanna have habitat through the growing season. So you need a variety of species, including things that bloom in spring. Early spring, like March, the best bet is to plant, is to have trees uh, like maple and willow. Uh, as we get into April and May, more wildflowers kick in like wild indigo, golden Alexander, and uh, so on and so forth. Um, I have things in my garden, multiple species blooming right now. Uh, it's late October. We still have plenty of pollinators out and about and they need food. So it's important to have the right things for them. So now I'll run down through the growing season uh, through some of my favorites. Uh, very beautiful, small tree, Mexican plum. Um, Prunus Mexicana, pretty easy to grow, blooms in March, uh, very nice for uh, small bees and small butterflies. 
Redbud. I don't need to say anything more about Redbud. It's the state tree. You all know about it. Easy to grow, great for bees. Blue bonnets and paintbrush. Well, the blue bonnets are native to Texas, but you can give them a try here. Paintbrush is native to Oklahoma. Uh, this species, uh, quite good for monarchs. One of, the, one of the few forbs that monarchs really like in the spring. Glandularia by, by Panatophyta, uh, fairly easy to grow. This one, already, already a major part of the, uh, really the mainstream nursery trade, purple coneflower, because as many of you have seen, they uh, come in all colors now, cultivars uh, that are white and yellow and orange. Um, they're, they're all attractive. And in my experience, the cultivars are, are, are good for uh, pollinators as well, um, as long as they're not, uh, not too crazy. Back to my favorite perennial, butterfly milkweed. Why do I love it so much? It's extremely pretty. Modern caterpillars eat it, but it's extremely attractive to pollinators, including a bunch of butterflies that we hardly ever see like the coral hair streak. You will almost never see this butterfly unless you are at a butterfly milkweed plant. This butterfly adores the nectar of the species. Same thing with the banded hair streak. Looked pretty similar to the last hair streak, I know, but it's a different species. And now another hair streak. This one is rare. This one might end up on the endangered species list someday. But if we plant more butterfly milkweed, it probably won't end up on that list. You can see, of course, my background is butterfly milkweed. I, I, I really love that plant. Midsummer, you can't go wrong with wild bergamot. Easy to grow, somewhat drought tolerant, uh, really great for butterflies and bees. Smells great, looks great. This is a species I really didn't know a thing about until about four years ago, Anis hyssop. Now it is available. Um, at quite a few nurseries I, uh, here in Oklahoma. Uh, the Latin name, Agastache funiculum. And what you see there is a single plant that is just in fantastic soil and I, I water it frequently. It's in a raised bed. And I don't know any plant that is covered with bees and small butterflies as much as this one in midsummer. Um, the photo on the right is a close-up of a viceroy butterfly. On the left, um, I got in the habit of going out there and counting how many butterflies. And when I took that photo, there were 15 butterflies on this plant at one time. That's, that's a lot. Uh, at other times, there were 20 bumblebees or 25 bumblebees on the plant at a single time. Agastache, Anis hyssop, feeds a lot of bees. Verbenas, uh, they could be a nice choice. The one on the left, Verbena stricta, likes dry soil uh, or does well in dry soil. The one on the right needs it a little bit moist. In late summer, I'm a big fan of sylphium species such as cup plant. Uh, it's called cup plant. Take a look on the left. Notice the large leaves uh, wrap around the stem forming a really solid cup that catch water during a rain. So after a rain, you go out and the cup plant leaves have a few tablespoons of water. It's a pretty interesting feature, pretty fun. But what's really great is how beautiful the flowers look and how attractive they are to bumblebees, to monarchs and other pollinators. In late summer, now I'm getting really crazy tall thistle. All thistles, just about all thistle species with those purple flowers are really tasty for pollinators. I don't want you to plant all thistles. Most thistle species, many thistle species are from Europe and they're horrendous weeds. That's what most of us think when we think of whistle, thistles, we think of spiny weeds that are a problem. But we actually have native thistles that are not weedy and that will stay put in a garden and are amazingly attractive to pollinators. And one of the best is tall thistle, Circium altissimum. Blazing stars are gorgeous, typically pink and purple. 
many species of them. Uh, one that is not native to Oklahoma, but it's native to South Texas, and it survived our minus 14 degree winter last year. Um, I have about eight of these plants. Greg's Blue Mist, they're called. I have about eight, and they all survived minus 14 degree Fahrenheit temperatures. So uh, even though they're from South Texas, they're tough and um, really great, really great for, for butterflies in particular. Greg's Blue Mist. Sunflowers, all of the sunflowers are good. Um, and I, I don't, I better not go into them specifically. Goldenrods, there are dozens of species of goldenrods. In general, they are terrific as well. Some are more attractive than others, admittedly. Asters, we have dozens of species of native asters. This is one of my favorites because I have a lot of it on our, we have a lot of it on our farm, willow leaf aster. It's extremely drought tolerant. So if it's growing in a really dry spot, it might not even, it might not look so hot, but it survives. It's tough as nails. If you put it in good soil and give it some moisture, the plant gets bigger, the flowers get more copious and the flowers get larger and more beautiful. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a lovely plant to have in any garden. Here's my favorite annual, golden crown beard, Verbicina and celioides. Beautiful flower when looked up, uh, if you look at, it up, uh, look at it up close. No, I don't know of any species, annual or perennial, that attracts as wide a variety of pollinators as golden crown beard. Um, small butterflies, large butterflies, tiny bees, huge bumblebees, like the, the, what we're seeing there in the middle is the American bumblebee, which, which by the way, People are thinking should be an endangered species. They're proposing it as an endangered species. Luckily, we here in Oklahoma have a, a lot. So our work to save this species in Oklahoma, I think will keep this species off the endangered species list. Um, butterflies, all big and small, love golden crown beard as well, especially monarchs. Another reason why native plants are so great is because native plants are more likely not only to be nectar sources and pollen sources, but they're more likely to be host plants. So what you see on the left is a caterpillar, a butterfly caterpillar of the silver, uh-oh. Uh, Summer, is everything okay? Oh no. Ray? Yes. Hey, this is Halder Howard. Um, Hi. So, so we had a discontinuity. We kind of lost your signal there for a little oh, bit. Rats. But also, we're, we're getting kind of close to the end of our time frame. Yes, indeed. Um, can I get back on or and just finish up? So we can hear you now. Go, Excellent. So go, go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead and share. Can you see? Can you see my screen still? No, it just went off. Just, just this. Oh, rats. Okay. Yeah, we caught the part about the uh, the verbicina, the golden crown. Good. Uh, okay. Well, um, and still no visual. Right. Okay. Well, let me close up then. Hey, John. We've got something. Okay, you're on takeaway messages now. Excellent, and you see it, right? Obviously yeah. you do. Excellent, okay. I will wrap up folks with takeaway messages and acknowledgements. Thank you, John. We can help pollinators by planting what they need. That is very clear. And there are hundreds of species of great native plants for our pollinator species do need to transmit the sad news that pesticides applied at the nursery can harm pollinators. 
I'm no expert on that, but colleagues of mine are. There's research to this uh, on this topic uh, that seems to be fairly convincing. So to, do please be careful with pesticide use on plants that are gonna be used by pollinators. But the biggest message, and I made this at the beginning, is pollinator gardeners develop a very deep interest in the plants and the pollinators um, so that they're going outside all the time to see what pollinators are uh, coming to their plants. That makes them more excited about the plants and that increases their desire to buy more plants for pollinators. Um, so um, I do think there is a market. Uh, well, I know there's a market. I think the, the market is growing and going to continue to grow for native plants for pollinators. I need to acknowledge the supporters of the Xerces Society, most importantly, our members, uh, but also a variety of uh, uh, nonprofits and corporations and uh, governmental organizations that fund our work. Uh, I do need to point out the donors make it possible. Uh, we are a donor supported nonprofit, so can, please consider becoming a member of the Xerces Society at our website. And lastly, um, if you have any questions, um, if there's time now, of course, I'm happy to answer questions. If there is not, please uh, take a photo of the screen with my email or write down my email address. And please shoot me an email. I love um, interacting with folks. I wish I was there interacting with you this morning. But um, thank you very, very much for your time. And uh, please let me know if there are any questions. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Ray. So I'm pretty sure that we have at least one question. Great. I just want to ask about water. And like the, the importance of water and the importance of the habitat of water for pollinators are the two issues in drought. I always wonder about that because- You mean um, like have, having, like Julie? You mean like having free water that's available for the pollinators directly? Sure. Sure. Like like a little little, little pools around where they can access. Yeah. Okay. So Ray, are mm -hmm. you able to hear that? Uh, Question. I could not hear much of that, but I think your question is, what is the importance of water features? Yeah. Yep. Um, I, I would say typically they're getting most of their water from, from the nectar, um, but having water features obviously won't hurt. You know, it, it, it can only help. Um, luckily, uh, currently, uh, we're lucky we have a big pond, but, you know, I rarely see the pollinators going to the edge of the pond, uh, taking up water. Um, and when we lived in our suburban garden, when we lived in uh, a suburban lot, we had no water feature and we had plenty of pollinators. So uh, I would say um, can't hurt, but not absolutely essential. Okay. Yep, question. Ray, thank you. That's awesome. Appreciate thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thanks, everybody. Hope you have an awesome day. So I don't know if you could hear that, but they were um, applauding you. So oh, I could not. <laughs> Great. Thank you so much.